Hey, everybody. So welcome to those of you joining on YouTube. Thank you for the switch of venues. For those that were following along on Facebook, I decided to switch to YouTube. Um, and so thank you for being here in the playlist entitled Talk and Tools for Thriving Through Tough Times, I think it's called. There is a playlist and it's now more organized where it says episode one, episode two, episode three. This is episode four. And so it should be useful in and of itself, whether or not you've seen episodes one through three. But if you're curious about episodes one to one to three, go back and check those out. And uh, please do subscribe to the channel because that helps it get out there to people if you think it's beneficial. Uh, I appreciate that. So here we go. Episode four. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we are still in this quarantine. It's still tough times. It's still a challenge for all of us in lots of different ways. And today I want to talk about um, the brain and how the brain will default automatically to survival mode. And here's the interesting thing, or there's a, there's a number of interesting things that I think that are important and relevant for us to know. First of all, the whole basis of what we're talking about here is is that I, as an intelligent human being, can learn how my brain functions, and then I can improve its function by learning about how it works. It's no different than, than a mechanic learning how to optimize the functioning of, of an engine. You know, granted, the brain is infinitely more complex, but there are simple things that we can understand about it so that we can use ourselves better, so that we can use, it's our brain, we get to use it. I mean, we get to we get to refine it. We get to tune it up, and so this information is really important for you if you want to thrive despite difficult times. We all have difficult times. We all have trauma. We all have challenges, and COVID is presenting a challenge for lots of us in lots of different ways. And so there are things that you can learn to help yourself improve the situation. Okay, um, so the first thing to know is that the brain is designed to default to survival mode. Survival is the brain's priority. It does not care about us being happy. The brain does not care about us being happy. It cares about survival and propagation of the species. This is evolutionarily built in. It is an extremely powerful mechanism. The survival mode goes on quick, fast, and it's easy to be triggered. It's easy to stay on. The alarm switch that we've been talking about in the first couple of classes is, you know, if you have a smoke detector in your house and it doesn't go off until the until the um, building is already burnt down, well, it's not a very good smoke detector. A good smoke detector is going to go off sometimes when you're cooking and it's going to go off sometimes if you, you know, light some incense or something like that, because that's doing its job. It, we want it to go off quicker than the, the real danger. Well, that's the same with our nervous system. The, the alarm system is going to go off quickly and easily. However, that that creates all sorts of negative negative uh, complications in our life, basically, is because when the alarm system is on, basically, when we go into states of fight, flight, or freeze, as we've discussed, fight is anger, frustration, impatience, criticism, judgment, attempting to control things, um, flight. Fear, anxiety, worry, doubt, panic, paranoia, all on a continuum, freeze, hopelessness, helplessness, numbness, depression, um, sense of worthlessness, isolation, no, um, sense of dissociation, right? So fight, flight, and freeze means the alarm system is on. And so the tricky part with us as human beings is that our alarm system is so sensitive, perhaps from... Who knows? Maybe a, the a, a working theory is that for thousands and thousands of years of our evolution, life was more dangerous on a day-to-day -day basis than it is really right now. And so we had maybe, um, so we had, had maybe to battle the woolly mammoth to get home to get food home for our family or something like that. Or we were regularly hit, worried about our shelter and our food and. We weren't yet quite at the top of the food chain the way that we are now. And, and, so, and so we have a very, very sensitive alarm system. And maybe that was useful for us. And the life expectancy during the most of our evolution was a lot shorter than it is now. 
So it wasn't that big a deal if we were in alarm, if we were in a state of alarm, it didn't really matter. It didn't the long-term benefit, the long-term detriment of being stressed out or in fight, flight, or freeze or survival mode for too long didn't really catch up to us because we died when we were 25 or 30 or 35, you know. But now we want to live a long, healthy, happy life. And being in a state of an alarm is shortening our lifespan because the 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 chemicals that are coursing through us are too much for our system to bear so when we are saying oh i'm stressed out or i am you know i'm regularly angry i'm regularly afraid i'm regularly depressed well then we are activating the survival part of our brain in situations that aren't necessarily life or death you know we're activating them sitting in our houses thinking about what could go wrong or we're activating thinking about what did go wrong or we're activating the survival part of our brain when things are not really life or death and therefore we are overtaxing our system and it creates all sorts of health complications, body, mind, and spirit, right? So the brain is designed to survive. It's not designed to be happy. However, thankfully, we are more than our brain. We are not our brain. We have a brain. We are our consciousness. We are our conscious awareness. This is in this, our, our consciousness um, perhaps utilizes certain parts of the brain that are different than the survival part of the brain, but it is we that get to choose to learn this information that we're talking about now and then to override the brain's tendency towards survival so that we can switch gears and put it put ourselves into thriving mode. It doesn't happen without being deliberate, without consciously choosing. Remember, the default auto program is survive. But we might want to thrive. We might want to be happy. We might want love. We might want creativity. We might want uh, outside the box thinking. We might want to you know, be awestruck at that beautiful sunset. We might want to dance. We might want to enter into flow states. We might want to um, make love instead of just screw to propagate the species. We might want to do all these things that require turning off the alarm switch and turning on the thriving part of the nervous system, which again has been the subject of our few classes before. So you can go back and look at some of the mechanics of what I'm talking about. Okay. So the tricky part when it comes to change is that the survival part of the brain labels what we've already been through the past as safe. And it makes sense. If I'm alive today, then anything that I've experienced is I have technically survived. So even if it's been depression, even if it's been anxiety, even if it's been anger, even if it's been trauma, even if it's been chaos, even if it's been a whirlwind, even if it's been a repetitive cycle of the same old, same old, same old. The, the survival part of the brain is like, that's perfect. I can survive all that. I know all that. I got that down. There's no threat there. Now we, our consciousness, our consciousness might be like, I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be anxious. I want to be happy. But the survival part of the brain is like, I don't care. Depression, great. I've survived that up till now. I've survived anxiety up till now. That's fine with me. You know, addiction, that's fine. I'm alive. Here, here we go. I'm alive. And so it's a little bit of a short-sighted strategy, just a short-sighted strategy on the survival part of the brain side. But that doesn't have consciousness. It's we that have consciousness. So we get to look at that and say, hmm, okay, I want something different. I want something new. I want something fresh. I want to evolve. I want to change. I want to improve my circumstances. And what is tricky about this, and but you're all going to be so familiar with this, is that the survival part of the brain labels that newness, that freshness, that unknownness of the future as dangerous. And actually, our efforts to change, so we go to change, and what, what do we, most of us do? We get we get excited about it. We do something for a few days and then boom, we start thinking, feeling, and acting in the same ways that we used to. What happened there is that our alarm switch got triggered because it's like there's like it's like there's a thermostat. Okay. Every single time we think we make a chemical, every single time that those chemicals course all through our body, 
and our body becomes used to that status quo. There's a neurobiological chemical stew that our cells are swimming in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and so we become very, that becomes our familiar, that becomes like 98.6. That becomes like when we're, the thermostat in our house, when it's, you know, we like it at 68 degrees, right? Well, then 68 degrees for us, even if it's depression or anxiety or addiction or just, you know, not really being satisfied, being grumpy, whatever it is. Well, if that's our 68 and we go to try to change the climate, we go to try to change, improve the temperature and say, you know what? I think I, I'd prefer to have it a little cooler today. I want it, I want it in 66. Well, our survival part of our brain goes, alarm, 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 something's wrong, something's wrong, the status quo is off. And what it does is that it kicks on the thermostat and it actually will turn your heat back up so that you get back to the familiar 68, to the comfy, cozy past, to the familiar, to what is safe. So when you go to change, it actually can trip your alarm switch. And this is what people call self-sabotage. Oh, yeah, I always sabotage myself. Well, really, the survival part of your brain sabotages yourself. Remember, we talked about the brain as having three parts. And of course, it's an incredible oversimplification. But it's useful for us to think about it this way. And so if you can see this diagram, I know it might be a little bit small, but you remember we have the thinking part, the emotional part, and the instinctual part, okay? And so the alarm switch is right in here. And when the alarm switch goes off, it sends a signal up, boom, boom, something's wrong. There's a feeling that something doesn't feel, feel right, <clears throat> right? This is like when we try to change things. We're, we're excited at, at first for the first four or five days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, but then all of a sudden there's like something just doesn't feel right, I, right? And so... <clears throat> So that alarm switch goes off and it sends a message up to the thinking part of the brain. And now the thinking part of the brain starts thinking in terms of like, I wonder, well, maybe I should, maybe it's a better idea if I just rest, or maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should just cut myself some slack, or maybe I shouldn't stick to it. Maybe I, uh, <clears throat> you know, oh, I should just have one cut, one, just one cookie, whatever it is, we start thinking the way we feel, Okay. So we feel it, that something is wrong with the alarm switch. That's down in the deeper part of the brain. And then we start thinking the way we feel. And then when we start thinking the way we feel, we start feeling the way we think. <clears throat> because now I'm thinking, oh, no, you know, I shouldn't do this. And then we start acting in, in that way. And it reinforces that we get stuck in this thinking, feeling loop. We think what we feel. We feel what we think. We think what we feel. We feel what we think. And this generates a tremendous amount of it in, in intensity. And we mistake intensity as truth. So if I think, oh no, what's going to happen? It's going to be awful. I'm going to get, you know, if I go there, I'm going to panic. I just know I'm going to panic. And then I'm imagining myself going there and panicking. And then I think that I'm going to panic. And then I start to feel panicked. And then I say, hey, yeah, I, I, I really probably will panic because I feel like I'm going to panic. And then I start thinking, yeah, that's right. I feel like I'm going to panic. So I think, yeah, I bet I would panic if I did go. And then I'm, and, and you see how it gets stuck in this reinforcing loop. And we say, it must be true because I think and feel it with incredible intensity. Well, actually the thinking and feeling intensity is nothing to do with truth. It just has to do with the repetition of this loop. And so the survival brain will kick on when we try to make drastic change in our lives and it'll get us to think and feel the way we used to think and feel. It'll adjust our thermostat back to cozy, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a little tickle in my throat. Don't worry. <laughs> so, the thinking feeling loop. Now, here's a little trick. I, sug I strongly suggest you read a book that I've recommended before. It's by BJ Fogg and it's called Tiny Habits because what he lays out there is a way around this. Basically, Tiny Habits is a way of changing that does not trip our alarm switch. We do such small, deliberate, incremental change that it doesn't set off our alarm. And before we know it, it's just now we have real change. And people say, oh, that doesn't work. That's, you know, 
but actually it works faster because you don't have the backslide. You don't have the rebellion. You don't have the self-sabotage. If you build incrementally, your nervous system doesn't notice it and it doesn't freak out. So that's more than I can get into in this talk, but do yourself a favor and read BJ Fogg's Tiny Habits and you'll get a really great ninja way to sneak around the alarm system so that you can actually create sustainable lasting change in your life. But for us, the tool that I want to talk about today <clears throat> is, is what you can do about it. Okay. And what you can do about it is, is recognize that this is going to happen, but real change means that you are coming from a future. You have a future that you've envisioned. And then you are trying to bring that future into the present. But what we're typically doing as human beings when we're an autopilot and where we're not consciously deliberately choosing, what we're usually doing, what we're really doing is just reacting the past over and over and over again. You ever notice that not much changes throughout your day, day to day? Same, get up the same way, brush your teeth the same way, same hand, same cup of coffee, same drive to work. Well, not right now, but same people that you see, same kind of similar conversations, same emotional reactions, same set of feelings, same YouTube videos, same uh, same Netflix, <clears throat> same foods, similar tastes, similar flavors, similar interactions and arguments and enjoyments or whatever with your with your loved ones or people that you know. And so but basically we're on autopilot for the most part. And that brain loves that. This is great cozy, comfortable, familiar, safe, right? But not a lot of change there and maybe a little bit depressing, right? Maybe a little bit stagnant, maybe a little bit like, what's the point of all this, right? So what instead we need to do is we actually need to know that we, that this thing that our brain tells us is terrifying, the unknown, is not really. <clears throat> Real, unknown is really where all possibilities come from. By definition, anything that's new has to come from the unknown. So if you want something, anything that's different, so if you want something different in your life, if you've been depressed for 20 years and you don't want to be depressed anymore, then you, by definition, have to go into the unknown. And you have to, in doing so, are going to have to take a chance and take a risk that says, maybe the freak out feelings that I'm feeling are not actually true. They're based on that thinking feeling loop, but they're not actually useful to me. And in fact, I, I need to move forward with this embarking into the unknown. <clears throat> One way to do that is to create a future identity. What does this mean? So basically, if you consider what is your most important values and your most important virtues, this is another whole huge topic. A book that I highly recommend for this one is Evan Carmichael's One Word, okay? And so if you consider what is the most important thing to me that I would, you know, if I had to, if I was going to die in a week, this is what I would focus on. And if I was going to live for a million years, this is what I would focus on and still be happy. This virtue, whatever this virtue is, or maybe you try a bunch of them. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to narrow it down to the, this one yet, but that might be a really useful thing to do as you would read in, in Evan Carver Michael's book, but a virtue based say, so say, for example, I just decided that tomorrow I wanted to be as joyful as possible. And we talked about this in the last lesson with priming. So go back and check out the priming. So say I was going to prime myself for joy. And I was going to say, well, I wonder how joyful I could be tomorrow. I wonder how much I could notice joy. I wonder where I would notice joy. Who would who would I see more joy in? How would I express more joy? How would I? And I would prime myself for joy. So what I'm doing is is that I'm priming myself in for the future, and I'm and I'm asking myself questions. Questions comes from the higher thinking, creative part of the brain. So that's getting moving myself up out of the alarm state by asking myself open-ended questions. I wonder what it would be like being curious, exploring. I wonder how I could be more joyful tomorrow. So then what I'm doing is that I'm basically creating a future identity for tomorrow, which is joy, instead of the identity based on the past, which is I've been depressed for the last 20 years, right? 
And so, by the way, if that's the case, it might not be as simple as just this one thing, but there's lots of other tools that we can combine together. So this is a useful concept. This is one piece of the puzzle. So for me, I have done the work to kind of work on what is the one thing, right? And the one thing, which is the name, kind of the hashtag that I'm focusing on this YouTube channel is all love, right? And so all love, it's packed with all sorts of meaning and symbolism and acronyms for me. And that's all, that's all just a part of the process that I've gone through, through some of these resources, like the one word book and some other things. But you don't need to have all that to understand the profundity and the simplicity of this concept. So what if it's just love? How do I be more loving tomorrow? What if my, what if my identity that I really want to have is love? I am love instead of I am depressed. I am anxious. I am afraid. I am worried. I am the past. I am what my parents wanted me to be. I am what the government told me I should be. I am what my trauma says I should be. This survival part of the brain is okay with all those. The survival part of the brain is like, yeah, identify with your trauma. Identify with your past. Identify with the commercials that you remember from when you were a kid. Identify from the way you were raised, zero to seven. Identify from there. That's all familiar and safe neurological territory. And I don't, and and I, we can survive that. We don't care about being happy. Remember that part of the brain doesn't care about being happy, but it says I can survive that. That's good. But I want more than that. I want something different. So this all love is what I really want. <clears throat> and that gives me, frankly, tons to work with because all love, I ain't there yet. So that gives me a lot of spiritual gym exercises because any time that I'm not loving is an opportunity for me to grow and be loving. Well, wonderful. So I'm always growing, which means I'm always, which means I'm really alive, <clears throat> right? Because anything that's alive is growing. It's either growing or dying. I want to be on the growing side of that, of that spectrum. So <clears throat> if love is your future identity, then you get to say to yourself, how would love think? How would love feel? How would love act? How would love perceive? How would love experience? I'm priming myself for the future. I am invoking what would it be like? I know what it feels like to feel loving. I don't necessarily know what it feels like to feel loving tomorrow, but I know what it feels like to feel loving. But I'm so I'm I'm borrowing from all of my experience of what love feels like. And then I'm projecting that into the future instead of the past survival stuff. Okay. And then as I meet new experiences, as new experience arises, and I have this identity of, oh yeah, yeah, I'm 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 to be loving here. So a cool trick is that I that I learned from a mentor of mine, and he learned it from someone else. Um, and, and I'm not even sure the the uh, the progression of how that went, but is is to consider yourself like an improv actor. And so an improv, someone an an improvisational actor needs to stay true to their character, true to their true to their role. Yet at the same time, they don't know what anyone else is going to say. So that's exactly like real life. Now, we've already memorized a role. The role that we've memorized is the one that the survival part of the brain thinks is safe. So we are, I am Mike, I'm, hey, Mike, I'm, I'm an alcoholic, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, whatever it is. We've memorized those roles. We know the lines, we know the feelings. We don't need to, we don't need to, uh, we don't need to try. It's automatic. We think that that's true, but it's really just the thinking feeling loop. It's really just because we've done it with such frequency, intensity, and duration that it's become easy and automatic. Our whole personality structure has been habituated and we take it to be reality when really it's just a very, very, very strong and well-wired habit. When I go to try to change that habit, it's difficult. I now need to learn a new part. I don't know the new lines. I don't know the emotions. But when so I don't. I'm not an expert. I'm not an actor at all. But I, I, I think that I've learned enough about maybe some of the concepts to say when a method actor 
when, when an actor is really good, they're not just acting like they're sad or they're happy. They actually are. They actually change their chemistry. And that's what makes the, the performance is convincing because they're really feeling it. They've actually changed their chemistry. They're not just like, they're not just thinking that, oh yeah, they're not just thinking that they're the role. They become the role. And it even becomes a problem for some actors, right? They stay stuck in that de depressive role or whatever, because they generate that, they generate the, the flavor and the chemistry of that role so deeply that it actually causes them some problems. But let's not think about that side of it right now. Let's focus on what's useful for us. Is so if I want to create a new character, which is love, and that's my future identity, that's my role that I want to play in the world, I want to be all love. And so then I contemplate on that and I think about and I practice what would it be like? What would it be like to be more loving? What would it be like to be more joyful, more open, more kind, more aware? Whatever virtue floats your boat, whatever excites you, whatever you feel passionate about. And so then I'm an improv actor and I say, here I go. Today I'm going to meet the world. I have no idea what this person's going to do or that person's going to say. And my challenge is to stay true to my character, to stay true to the role that I choose for myself. Not the role that my parents chose for me, not the role that the culture chose for me, not the role that my trauma chose for me, not the role that commercials chose for me, the role that I choose for myself. I need to stay true to my role and rest assured you will be challenged. There will be people, especially the people that know you, that are familiar with you, that are really good at plugging into the equation of your old personality, your old role, your old familiar self. They're not doing it on purpose. It's not their fault. That's they're familiar. They're interacting in, in ways with you that are familiar to them. That's their safety mode. And they're threatened by you becoming new or different. How many people know that experience when friends and family hold us to who we were and continually interact with us as if we were who we were instead of who we are becoming, right? And so we don't need to go into a, a trip or a blame or 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 hating them for that. That's normal, but it's not natural. It's not the optimal possibility. So when I stay true to my character, I'm able to improv my way and say, yeah, it's dynamic. It's fluid. I don't know what's going to say. I don't know. You know, what's that, that comedy show? Whose line is, is it anyway? I really have to be alive. I really have to be consciously engaged. I really have to be open. I really have to be aware. It's so easy to slip back into the autopilot, the easy, the automatic. Oh, the knee-jerk reaction. Oh, he says this. I say that. I do that, right? Instead, I have to be, pause. I have to do my fog breath. And if you don't know what the fog breath is, go back and check out the old videos. That's a way for me to switch my nervous system from surviving mode to thriving mode. And so true change, this is, comes from, um, I believe this, this, this thing, yeah. True change comes from, the is the ability to think, feel, and act differently today to the same stimulus as yesterday. I'll repeat that. Because that's the whole crux of like, am I, am I creating a future or am I reacting the past? If I'm creating a new future, then I need to think, feel, and act differently today to the same stimulus that got me upset yesterday. And those are the growing moments. Growth does not, it's wonderful when the, easy, enjoyable experience just comes along and we, you know, and it's, and it's easy to, you know, enjoy for me, it's, you know, it's easy for me to enjoy the beauty of my daughter and, you know, she's giggling or something like that. Well, that's easy. I can enhance that. I can become more conscious and aware of that, but the real work, that's not really the growth work. That's a, that's bonus material. I love it. Enjoy the heck out of it. But the real growth, the real alchemy, the real muscle of, of, of growing as a human being comes when you don't want to be loving. 
if my future that I want to create is all love, the real work is all the moments where I don't want to be loving. And how can I think, feel, and act differently in those moments than I have up until now? That's the work. That's how we grow. That's how we become inspired. That's how we nourish and nurture our spiritual development. That's what brings humans true satisfaction. That's how we master the curriculum of life. That's how we really are satisfied. And we know the difference between true happiness and satisfaction than pleasure, just pleasure. Nothing wrong with pleasure, but pleasure does not make us happy and satisfied. Unfolding our soul, developing our spirit, mastering our life brings happiness and satisfaction and with it numerous gifts to share with others. And so love self, love others, love all. And 